Four total, but she's the youngest oh, yeah. of three siblings yeah. of Brother John. All right. All right. Brother Pat right. is the father. <laughs> Everyone knows now, if you didn't, he's a preacher. <laughs> Corrected me. But that's all right, brother. Preacher came here. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Chesty. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Angel. Amen. Amen. Uh, Angel with us last night. Amen. Uh, Raised by their, her great grandparents and adopted by her great grandparents. Now it's mother and dad. They've raised Angel since she was four months old. Amen. And uh, praise God for the many grandparents that are raising their grandkids, but uh, yeah. seldom we hear about great grandparents <coughs> at that age. And we commend you, it is so honorable. And uh, they're here in Ryzen this week visiting family, cousins, and they keep up with me on the website. I knew I'd be here and wanted to just come and be a part of the revival this week, and we're glad they have. Good to see everybody tonight. Got a host of friends back in the house of the Lord. We've got the good folks here at Bethel number one. God has moved among us this week. We've had three shouts of newborn souls, decisions that are made, and we appreciate what God has done. Thankful to the Lord. Had a big day. I appreciate the celebration of Sunday school class for feeding us at the local Mexican restaurant this evening. And uh, even had uh, uh, Brother David to buy our lunch. David uh, Davis bought our lunch. Can you imagine? <laughs> us left early this morning for the golf course, Day of Fellowship, and uh, David uh, played so well, he spouted off how well he, he was feeling so good, he said, I'll just buy y'all's lunch. Well, we took him to one of the most expensive places in our country. He had never been there, and he probably won't ever go back. And uh, Benny, we had to twist his arm to get him to go. He kept saying, I'm so hot, and I'm too hot to eat, I'm too hot. Well, he ate two and a half plates. <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd hate to know I had to feed him if he wasn't hot. <laughs> but we had a great time. It was good. It sure was. And uh, it's been a great week. We're glad you're here tonight. I'm going to invite you to turn your Bible to the book of Exodus chapter 33. Amen. Exodus chapter 33. Good to have my preacher brother in the house again tonight. Brother Pat and uh, Brother Alvin, Matt Fulmer, Alvin McMahon. And uh, good to have our friends as well. And I certainly would uh, never want to have a service without recognizing my mother when she was present. She's back tonight. Good to see her again. Called her early this morning. Checked on her a little bit. And she said, well, we're planning on coming back tonight. Marlene, thank you for doing that. I won't let her drive by herself. And uh, she'll drive by her, hour and a half, even further if somebody's with her. I miss Dad. Dad loved coming to Bethel number one. And uh, many of you have known my dad for years and years and served on the cemetery board, black cemetery with him. And we miss dad, but I'm so grateful that mama still has the health Amen. and uh, the abilities to drive and uh, to come out and support her son. Amen. I am glad tonight that uh, Bethel number one is doing so well. And I appreciate your spirit. Appreciate your love for your pastor, and his family, Colleen and the four boys, Noah and uh, Benjamin, Levi, Titus. And uh, every time I come for revival, Colleen gets news that she's going to have another baby. <laughs> so I expect to hear that between now and tomorrow night. <laughs>
good, good. Brother Pat, Sister Kay, we love you, son. And uh, thank of him as one of our own. Thank you for raising him and other children, four together in the Lord. For Jesse, the youngest, bless in our heart tonight. What a sweet spirit she has. And to come and be with us. I uh, think about those that have had such difficult lives. Those that often are labeled not to ever have a chance. Thank God there are some folks who love and who take in and who care for those <coughs> that were never cared for. Beginning in their birth and raising them. Yes, going beyond the call and duty with love and compassion. You see so many in revivals that I do these last 18 years full-time evangelism, I'm on my 808th revival. Amen. 808. All over the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast, primarily in Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. But in our travels, we've seen many decisions that were made whom folks never thought they would amount to anything. And over the years, it's good to keep up with some to see how far they've grown in the Lord and how they have made something out of their life. You see, you cannot change your lineage, who you belong to. But you can change your legacy, Amen. how you'll be remembered. Edwin Booth was one of the famous Shakespearean actors of the 18th, excuse me, the 19th century in the 1800s. And uh, he could not change his lineage. He was the brother of John Wilkes Booth, Abraham Lincoln, assassin. He could never change that. He was always his brother. But I find it interesting in reading in history that Abraham Lincoln's youngest son, Robert Lincoln, was during the Civil War, was boarding a train to go to school, 17 years of age, to college. And it was so crowded at the depot there and on the platform. Also in the crowd was Edwin Booth. And uh, the space between the train and the edge of the platform, about three feet, with the hustle and bustle, Lincoln, President's son, fell. And he was caught under the train. And the train began to move. And it so happened that Edwin Booth was standing there about to board the train. Not knowing who it was, but an instinct, he dove off, risking his own life, and pulled away Robert Todd Lincoln to his safety. When the news media heard about it, when the dust had settled and everyone discovered that it had been Edwin Booth who saved Abraham Lincoln's son's life. From that day forward, Edwin Booth was no longer remembered as the brother of the assassin, but he was remembered as the man who saved the president's son's life. Amen. He could never change that lineage, but he certainly changed that legacy. Amen. No doubt excuse because of your parents or your raising that you don't have a chance. You can make something out of your life. I have from time to time some tell me, well, I, I'm not going to mount anything because my daddy was an alcoholic, my, my mother was a slut and, and trash. And I said, oh no! You can't change who you are. Right. Where you come from. But you can certainly change where you're going. Yeah. Make a 
difference in your life. Amen. I look at our churches today. Some of our churches in history have had troubles and problems. Many of our associated churches among the BMA have been problematic churches. You look at the life expectancy of expectancy tenure of a pastor in some of our churches is about 12 months to maybe a year and a half. Yeah, that's right. I know there are a lot of bad preachers, you know, in the barrel, but not all of them are bad. <laughs> you think out of 20, one or two of them would be pretty decent. Amen? Yeah. Amen. We have problematic churches even today. In many of our churches We've literally have lost the glory of God. Right. America is a nation that we love so dearly. That's right. Aren't you thankful that you're a citizen of America? Yeah. We ought to just right now shout and thank God yeah. that we're here in the blessed United States of America. Yeah. By the providence of God, most of us were born in the American state. Could have been born in Africa with a bone in her nose. Yeah. Or some other third world country. Yeah. But we're blessed. Yeah. And we all recognize it. And even in the Bible Belt, here in the South, we thank God for our upbringing. Right. Most of us cut our teeth in church. I was raised in Salem Missionary Baptist Church. Mother died. Daddy remarried my mother. She lived on the east side of Pine Bluff. We immediately became members of Broadmoor. And uh, man, I, I out there in Salem, there always was a tree that contained a number of switches. <laughs> Back in the day, there was no question. You didn't question mom and dad. Both of my mothers, if the CPA were around back then, they both would have been incarcerated until they died. <laughs> I didn't know a peach tree grew tree peaches until I was nearly grown. <laughs> but there was a tree there at Salem parking lot, and it wasn't nothing to have two or three mamas get up during the singing or the preaching and march us out, depending who got in trouble, and invariably straight to that tree in the parking lot. The preacher knew what was going on. He just kept preaching. But it made us all who we are tonight. And I thank God for it. I remember as a kid, they had a fundraiser out there at Salem, Watson Chapel, and raising money to pay the parking lot. We didn't know as kids anything about shouting, but if we did, we certainly would have been shouting all over the church. Because we knew when they paid the parking lot, they'd have to cut down that tree. Would you believe they paved around that tree? <laughs> and even after I got grown and had kids, Every now and then, go and visit Mom and Daddy. We'd come down 79 and, and come past Watson Chapel, and they'd done sold the church and rebuilt Salem Hat. And, and, uh, and, and I never will forget my kids were about young teenagers, and I just looked in there because that's where I was saved. And, and I'd done, I'd already shared with them where I was saved and it showed them in passing by, you know. But that day, I looked in there and I got out. And I saluted that old tree. <laughs> and then, what are you doing? I said, that made me a better person. <laughs> but we've seen the glory of God leave our churches. There was a day when folks hungered to see God meet with them. There was a day when we would have prayer meetings on Wednesday night and they were literally prayer meetings when men and women were down at the altar. And it wasn't a wholesale prayer. It was a day when men and women, I remember grandma and grandpa, uh, uh, not grandpa, he never did go much, but grandma and great grandma and, and uh, I remember daddy and, and then going over to Broadmoor. I remember those uh, testimony service and those prayer meetings back in the day they called somebody's name. Yeah. They didn't just pray for the Williams family. If old Ted 
Miriam was, was lost, the sinner, they called out his name. Right. Wasn't no gossiping going on. If he was an alcoholic, everybody already knew it. It wasn't plastered on social media. It was a text where you can read what you want to read between the lines. No, people were serious about bombarding the throne of God on behalf of their family and their neighbors and co-workers and their friends. There was a time when Landmark Missionary Baptists used to shout in services. Used to have amen pews. If you wasn't comfortable shouting, you didn't have to sit in the amen pew. But don't fuss over those who did. Amen. We uh, are the ones that started shouting. Yeah. When the charismatics came along later on, we allowed them to rob us of a blessing. That's right. Amen. Amen. Now that other bunch does all the shouting. You say, well, that doesn't have anything to, about the glory of God. Yes, it does. Because I tell you why. When God's glory meets with His people, there's a sense of great expectation that we no longer see in the house of God. You see, most of our church, sir, and I'm not fussing, God help us, I've pastored most of my life as well. But most of the time now, our services are already premeditated and prefigured before we ever get to church on Sunday. And you, in the parking lot, before you ever walk in, know you're going to sing three songs, make some blooming announcements, insulting everybody's intelligence because they're printed in the bulletin. <laughs> Moses is receiving the word of God on the mountain. 
And he had them come down and of course the children of Israel they reverted back to their idol worshiping and took all of them, or a lot of those spoils to go and formed a golden image. Yeah. They were having these parties and these orgies and they were worshiping this golden image when Moses came down. That's right. Sin, the great sin against God. And as a result, God told Moses, I ought to just wipe them all out. Consume them all yep. <clears throat> and start all over anew with the generation of people. And we see in Exodus 33 the success of the intercessory prayer of mighty man Moses. And he prays. 32 and then in 33 verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, Thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. Now let's pause there just for a moment. God has heard Moses' prayer. And God said to Moses, All right, I heard your prayer. Depart and go up hence. And the people of mine which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, and then carry them to the, to the land that I had promised them. Right. Verse number two, God said, And I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hevite, the Zebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, all oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? But notice the next phrase. God says, For I will not go up in the midst of thee. For thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And I want to call your attention to verse 4, and I'll, I'll be done here momentarily. Verse 4, And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned and no man did put on him his ornaments. If we had the time tonight, we could read the remainder of the chapter. It talks about how Moses went outside the tabernacle and how he pitched it with the camp. And how he began to pray and every man stood in his own tent waiting for Moses and his prayer. And how all the people saw the cloud. Uh, the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, how God came back and that His glory returned as a cloud, and how Moses face to face with the Lord. And, and I want you to skip on down in verse 17. The Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech you, God, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Moses said, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while I my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Praise the Lord, Moses saw once again the glory of God. Amen. But the children of Israel, at least, Though we cast a stone at them often about their sin, how could they sin and see all the miracles of God? Listen, at least they had the spiritual fortitude enough to know about them. What good is a land flowing with milk and honey without the bread of life? You see, when they heard from Moses what God had said, I'll send an angel. He'll fight your battles. I'll give you the land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I will not go with you. Can you imagine tonight? You and I meeting in church, having this series of services we call revival. 
And God's not even in our midst. I believe with all my heart that some here tonight may differ with me, and that's all right. I, I'm not a scholar when it comes to eschatology. But I do believe we're living in the last days according to the Word of God. Amen. It seems to me that it's obvious that it's winding down. So goes Israel, so comes the Lord. It's not about us over here in Western culture. If you want to study about it, the Lord coming back again, you've got to study the nation of Israel because He's God's chosen. They are God's chosen people. And God's clock is based on the nation of Israel. And I thank God that we are engrafted, aren't you? Amen. Into one Christ, one family, Jew and Gentile. That ought to get somebody excited for revival right there. The law that God would love not just His people, but He would reach out to you and I Amen. with the gospel, the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm thankful for these old songs and these books that we still have as hymnals. So many denominations have ripped them out of the pages. Thank God for the old blood songs because with what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We've been labeled blood slaughterhouse Baptist, that's all right. Label me what you want to label me. But I understand that Jesus Christ, when He went to Galgotha's Hill, took upon Him the sin cup of every one of us. None of us were deserving. We came into this world born naked, and naked we shall return. But Jesus, who had the robe of righteousness on His back, the Son of God, He took it off, became naked on the cross, that we might be clothed in His perfection. Amen. Amen. The blood of Jesus washes away all of our sins. And because that God so loved the world, I like that the King James, that Bible within the Bible. You see, John 3.16 is to the Bible what Washington, D.C. is to America. What London is to England, what Tokyo is to Japan, John 3.16 is the capital of all of God's Word. Right, right. It is the scarlet thread of the Old Testament. It is the sacrificial lamb of the New Testament. Right. All the Word revolves around for God so love the world. Amen. And you say are there are importances of, of the words in the Bible. Of course there are. It's no happenstance in the original text translated and then transliterated into what we have that we can read. Praise God we have a translation Amen. that we can read tonight. Amen. And when it's translated for God so loved, how do you so love? What's the difference in so loving and just love? For God so loved. It is the same word transliterated in the Greek from the Hebrew that we find in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. And you know that verse in the revival. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, and here it is, seek. My face. The word seek in the Hebrew is the same word as soul in the Greek in the New Testament. It means as we are to pursue, seek God with all of our heart, God has sought us with all of His love. Mm. I'd be the first to admit that I don't come close to deserving that kind of love. Yeah. Yeah. An unconditional love. Aren't you thankful tonight Amen. that when you got saved that God doesn't just keep you hanging over hell and the moment you make a mistake He drops you back in? Amen. <laughs> We're sealed to the day of redemption. Amen. Amen. And when He raised you and I up out of that horrible pit, Psalms number 40, and set our feet upon a rock, He raised us up, and we're not even a million miles close to hell again. Amen. Amen. 
sometimes the glory of God. Well, one of my heroes going on to be with the Lord several years ago, he was known as America's country preacher, great Southern Baptist preacher. I heard him back in the 70s on several occasions. His name was Vance Havener. Vance Havener had a way with words, kind of like <laughs> uh, Brother R.G. Lee did. Vance Havener wrote over 40 books. Vance Havener had many quotes that I have, but one of which he said, before we could evangelize the community, we must Christianize the church. Amen. We spend a lot of time, and rightfully so, about those on the outside when we need a revival on the inside. Amen. Amen. The glory of God to return. Yeah. I thought about what some say today. I'm convinced that society, those around us who are unchurched, they don't find any fault in Jesus. They find fault in us. Mm -hmm. Very few have I ever talked to that said they found fault in Jesus. At least seven groups or individuals in the New Testament during the crucifixion process stood up and said, I find no fault in him. Pilate, Pilate's wife, yes. the centurion soldier at the cross that crucified said, surely this is a righteous man. <laughs> Judas went out and hanged himself and said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Peter said, there's no vile found in his mouth. Paul said, there's no sin in his mind. Writer of Hebrews said he was tempted in every area that you and I are. There was no sin in his body. It says yet he was without sin. That's right. The perfect son of God. And yet, people find fault with us. You see, all the world is wanting to see is a real Christian. They say, show me a Christian. Not a camouflage, counterfeit, compromising someone that says they are. You see, the world, they know our songs. They know our sermons. They've heard us sing. They've heard us preach. But they want somebody to stand for what they sing. They want somebody to practice what they preach. Amen. We as churches, really, if you be honest, and I'm just generalizing, I'm not speaking specifically about Bethel number one or your church you represent here tonight. But as a whole, our churches are more known for our car washes and our rummage sales and our cake walks and our raffles, whatever we have. And any means we have to raise money for our own selfish needs. Amen. Now think about it. Hear me out before you throw me out. The world knows us by sitting up in a parking lot selling cakes to raise money for a youth trip. To have fun with You say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I understand there's nothing wrong with that. But God help us. We need to do some evangelism that is servanthood. Why don't we just have a free car wash and tell everybody that we wash their car about Bethel number one and the church of the living Jesus Christ. Amen. How about we make a bunch of cakes and give them away? Cook a bunch of barbecue and offer them a sandwich and give them a track and not want anything in return. Amen. We can make a difference. We ask God to bless us. There was a survey, Brett, you just tell me you live a lot a, long, a while down in Houston. Did you ever know Sage Mont Baptist Church heard it? 
Great church, but the board has pastored there for many, many years. Great Southern Baptist Church. They run thousands. Good conservative evangelistic church. They did a survey in Houston, Metroplex. They surveyed 2,000 restaurants. And in that survey, they had the questionnaire to the servers of the restaurants. What is the worst time for you to serve in your 40-hour shifts of employment? Over 70% came back. The worst time to serve the public was from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. They said, God, church people, their kids are the rudest, and here it is, and church people live the poorest of tips. And we wonder why they don't come to our churches. All because the glory of God has departed. Amen. Life expectancy, I just heard not long ago, is now 80 years of age. Amen. 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 Eight years of age. 